I'm going to talk about COPVs, as was said, and in case there's anybody that doesn't know what a COPV is, it's actually a um, metallic liner overwrapped with a composite for either uh, pressure, you know, to, to hold either gases or propellants under pressure. And so um, with that introduction, um, these can operate at a high energy level and can result in significant risk. So I have an example here. If you've got a gas vessel, it's 1,300 cubic inches with a pressure of 9,700 PSI. Um, that's equivalent to 3.6 pounds of TNT. And so if you are not um, addressing all of the acceptance qualification um, and are not testing your pressure vessels adequately, then there can be significant risk to them. Um, I have a picture of the propellant and pressurant tanks for the Curiosity descent stage here. And the reason that I like this picture is because it shows people with it. The COPV, there's some metallic tanks, but the, I don't know if I can point or not. There's the um, COPV here, it's large, and you can see it relative to the size of the person that's in the picture. So they can be fairly large and they can be um, and hold quite a bit of volume of high pressure gas. Sometimes they're cylindrical or spherical in shape. Most of the time cylindrical COPVs are used. Let's see if I can get this. Yeah. Um, there were a large number of all metal pressure vessels that failed during the Apollo um, era. And so during the development of Apollo, this lesson learned was really critical and very important really for COPVs because a lot of the failure modes that were observed in these all metal pressure vessels also are very important to the liner. Um, three of those failed during while they were installed in the spacecraft. Two during a system test and one of course was Apollo 13 as everybody is probably familiar. Um, stress corrosion cracking was a, um, was a problem because at the time we didn't really understand um, the compatibility issues between um, different types of fluids that would go into the tank and the resulting um, reduction in capability of, um, of the pressure vessel. Um, others that failed during acceptance and qualification test had similar compatibility problems, stress corrosion cracking from red nitrogen tetroxide, um, which we know has, the formulations have been changed now, so it's not as big of a risk anymore, but, but still, it, having that compatibility turned out to be really critical. Weld cracks and embrittled weld repairs, stress corrosion cracking from water was a problem, and also sustained load crack growth in water. All of these um, fracture-based concerns were kind of flowed into a series of recommendations at the time. And so Glenn Ecord at JSC had put together a list of things for, you know, sort of a wish list for future pressure vessels. Um, and COPVs based on the, the experience from Apollo. Um, fracture mechanics clearly was um, pinpointed as a, as a key concern in pressure vessel design, and that didn't matter if it was a metallic pressure vessel or a COPV. Um, evaluate material selections for components and fluids used inside pressure vessels was another one. Compatibility, obviously. Uh, verify weld techniques, and then Regulate and control ground pressurizations of flight pressure vessels, also the number of those. Um, try to put a log together and know how many pressurizations you've had. And then the, the last two were, were aimed not necessarily at technical, very specific risks, but they were to establish a responsibility and authority for pressure vessels. And then also to not eliminate QA documentation or requirements for either don't remove requirements or testing of pressure vessels unless you have had sufficient oversight for such things. As a result of his note, and, and this was sort of the lessons learned that was written up initially for pressure vessels, um, Mariner 71, the Viking Project, and future pressure vessels were kind of following this guidance from Glenn Ecord that, that he developed at the time. Um, but still, requirements documents weren't really very well developed at that time. And so then we went into shuttle orbiter, and a lot of the same stuff happened again. <laughs> um, so there were issues with um, pressure vessel failures. 
So in this case, we had switched over to TIE 6-4 um, and nine pressure vessels, that, some of which were COPBs and some of which were all metal pressure vessels, um, failed or leaked from some of the same issues. Again, welding was a problem. Um, cracking was a problem. Um, we had multiple weld passes and repairs that were not, um, I guess, well controlled. We didn't completely understand how those were being performed. And as a result, we had nine failures and three failed um, in a, a slightly different way. And one of them, we never quite figured out why it failed before we needed to move on. Um, but a lot of those f issues were fracture related. And so um, there was fracture control board established um, to address a lot of other hardware, but pressure vessels for sure, and to try to mitigate this for all future missions. For ISS, there were a lot fewer of these issues because of Glenn Acord's note from the Apollo lessons learned and also um, the lessons learned on shuttle orbiter as well. Since that time, or I guess as the orbiter got older, additional questions came up for COPVs that were not originally recognized or considered to be um, problems. Um, but as it was getting older and the technology for COPVs was being developed and new failure modes were being recognized, um, things like um, stress rupture reliability of the Kevlar composite became a problem. We, 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 there had been some limited testing of the composite itself, um, but it wasn't very well understood how uh, long you could actually continue to operate pressure vessels that had been pressurized multiple times and over a long period of time. And so that became a concern, and the NESC did an um, investigation of into Kevlar stress rupture reliability for those pressure vessels to understand what the risks were. Um, impact damage was one where um, a, there had been a, a sort of an independent study that was um, funded by both uh, NASA and the Air Force to address impacts on the composite because it wasn't a concern in the Apollo days because you didn't need to be um, as concerned about impact damage because the metallic pressure vessels were less susceptible to failing as a result. But for Kevlar and for carbon COPVs that came after that for ISS, it did become a concern. And based on the laboratory tests, we weren't exactly sure where we were. Um, the fracture mechanics I've already mentioned was, it was and is continuing to be um, a challenge and we have to stay on top of that for future programs as well. The failure modes for COPVs were kind of, um, initially everybody thought that there was only two ways that a pressure vessel could fail and that included a COPV and that was by burst or by leak. Um, some of the standards even make that statement in them, but um, that's very high level. Um, one of the things that we've fought to work on in the new revision of the standard is to actually define very specific ways in which pressure vessels can fail. I mentioned several of the ones on this list um, that were from Glenn Ecord's original letter, um, and then some that have come up since, such as composite stress rupture, impact damage, uh, delamination, um, and, and corrosion that were recognized later. One thing for impact damage, as I mentioned, there was, I, I want to highlight this one because it is driving a lot of the discussion for, well, we need the impact damage control plan and we need information from various suppliers in order to understand risk that could occur from impact damage. A lot of that stems from a, this study, which is the same Air Force and NASA combined funded study where um, they went through and impacted a large number of COPVs and looked at, well, what is the reduction in burst strength? What is the risk as, as a result? Um, and there's really not a good mitigation approach to this other than process control. So um, process controls have to incorporate this. And this lesson was really not learned necessarily from an accident or a problem that occurred in service. It's from a it's from this particular study. And so there can be lessons learned, I guess, from certainly from COPVs in our case, where it's not learned 
necessarily from an accident. It's a, it's an imagined concern that then in the laboratory through examination of the failure mode, we can actually um, understand whether or not it's a large risk. This one is. Stress rupture, as I mentioned, for, um, for COPVs, it wasn't recognized really well early on in the shuttle days. It became a bigger concern much later, although there was sort of a thread of, of concern with this throughout. This is a time-dependent failure mode where the composite will suddenly fail under working loads. In order to understand it, it is a, it's a um, low probability and high consequence kind of failure. So it's very difficult to get at um, what the risk actually is. So the NESC and the ISS program are doing, are wrapping up, both of them are wrapping up test programs to really try to quantify that risk and understand it. Again, this, there have not been failures in service of stress rupture, but there have been failures in the laboratory. Um, we can make this happen, and that does not make it not a risk. It makes it something that we can, um, that we know is out there that we need to get a handle on. There have been a lot of other issues from flight projects with COPVs. One is liner buckling. Um, the liner and the composite are some, sometimes bonded together to give you a sort of a, a combined structure. Um, the bonded liners rely on the bond line to provide adequate fatigue life and to prevent buckling. If you can get, if you get buckling in your liner, it can significantly reduce your cycle life. Um, and that, so it becomes a significant problem. The liner buckling has been seen numerous times. That's, uh, this picture right here is showing some buckles in here. Um, well concavity and composite bridging. This is a picture of composite uh, where you actually, this was bonded to the liner and this was not. Um, that, has, that actually did cause a failure um, a number of years back that I think is in the um, lessons learned uh, database, but it, um, it basically resulted from a weld concavity, which seems like a really small and very specific detail um, that, you know, well, all the engineers should already have taken care of. Um, but if, if you don't have significant oversight, if you're not really looking deeply enough, would be something that might be easily missed. Uh, let's see, the next one. So, to summarize, um, even though there's a long history of using COPVs for flight, they are inherently high risk just because of the enormous amounts of energy associated with them. Failure modes are well defined and standards exist to capture typical approaches to mitigate them. And so that is a lot of, a lot of the lessons learned that we've had in COPVs over the years have gone into various um, standards. And so there are specific standards that, that if followed, should help you mitigate them. There is, they are subject, like all standards, um, they're subject to interpretation, which can be kind of problematic and, and usually requires a discussion. Um, ongoing work to address COPV risks for our, that are still not fully understood are, are, are continuing. So that stress rupture, impact damage, liner crack growth, to name three that I'm personally working with. Um, also, um, understanding risk does require adequate visibility into how the requirements are met. And sometimes these seemingly small details can be the big gotchas in there. And so it does require, for COPVs anyway, a lot of um, detailed review and kind of significant oversight. So I'm Brian Anderson. I'm going to talk, about, I'm going to talk a lot about the Orion parachute system. Um, I primarily work on, but um, I think all these lessons are applicable to all the other human rated uh, uh, parachute systems as well. Um, so, first, a little bit about the Orion parachute system itself. Um, so, so we, we, we start, start off uh, upper left corner of the chart there. Uh, the forward bay cover is jettisoned, which uh, covers the, the, the forward bay. Um, uh, Three uh, four bay cover parachutes are mortar deployed and they assist in uh, taking the four bay cover away from the vehicle. Uh, following that, 
we de mortar deploy uh, two drogue parachutes. They're meant to help stabilize the vehicle and also to slow it down. They go through uh, three different uh, stages. Uh, the reason we go through the stages on both the drogues and the mains is um, to make sure that we don't impart too much load on the vehicle and on the parachutes themselves. Um, the drogue parachutes are then cut away and uh, we mortar fire three pilot parachutes and their, their sole purpose is just to pull the main parachutes out of their base. And then the, uh, you can see in the lower right uh, corner the, the main parachutes, they also go through um, different stages as well. So this is the, the nominal mission, and then uh, for low altitude and pad abort, uh, we skip the drogue phase uh, so that we can get to uh, main full open as soon as we can, uh, so that if we, you know when we hit the water, we have uh, three fully open main parachutes. And that becomes important uh, a little bit later. I'll talk about that. A little bit just briefly about parachute fabrication. Uh, we use a, a vendor named Airborne Systems out in California. You can see the upper left corner, and you can see the pilot parachutes laid out there on the packing table. Uh, upper right picture shows uh, four big cover parachutes. The yellow, it's an all, an all Kevlar parachute uh, as it was being inspected. And then uh, the bottom center picture there shows the, the sewing of one of the EDU uh, main canopy engineering development unit main canopies. Um, they have these huge tables and uh, really, really old sewing machines that they use uh, to, to make those. Uh, each main has about, it's a little bit over 10,000 square feet of material. Uh, it's pr they're, they're all pretty big. Um, once uh, the parachutes are fabricated, then we, we put them into uh, packing fixtures. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to show the main packing, the main part of it main parachute, excuse me. In the upper left, you can see there's the, the main packing fixtures. That's what we, we push all of that material into that, uh, that container there. It's, uh, it's irregularly shaped so that it will fit inside of the, uh, the volume that we've been given um, on, the, on the spacecraft. Uh, the picture in the upper right shows one of our packing tables. Uh, these packing tables are crazy long, um, but they're even though they're so long, they're not long enough to actually fit one of the main parachutes. If you, if you lay the main parachute out, it's something like 27 or 28 stories tall, each, each main parachute. Um, once we, so we, we start to put the parachutes into the packing fixture and we stow it, the, the lower left corner shows the suspension lines in process as they're being stowed and it's a very controlled, um, uh, procedure that we go through to make sure that we have that everything comes out in the right sequence and then um, we use uh, different hydraulic we, we use a hydraulic press and we press at different points in the packing operation uh, we press up to 50,000 pounds to uh, to push the parachute material down and, and make it fit in that in that volume um, uh, once uh, I haven't uh, once, once it's all pressed down in there, the, the parachute has the density of, of about wood. It's about the density of wood once we press it all down inside there. Um, and then this, this is a, a picture from one of our drop test vehicles. Uh, just to give you an idea of, of where the parachutes go once they get into the spacecraft, it, it looks uh, somewhat similar. Uh, once it gets on the spacecraft, you can see um, the, the main parachutes. Uh, there's three of them. Uh, Looks like, so about two o'clock, about four o'clock, and about uh, I guess that's about eight o'clock. I guess uh, where those main parachutes are located. The drogue parachute uh, canister. They're put into the the mortar canisters at about uh, what is it, uh, maybe eleven or ten o'clock and and noon, and then uh, the pilot parachutes are are next to the main parachutes, and the the parachute risers are then stowed around. Um, you can see like the orange, there's an orange line that, uh, that kind of goes around the, the circumference of the tunnel there. And that, uh, that's, that's how those are stowed and the risers attached to the vehicle right there about 11 o'clock. Um, so uh, I think maybe one of the reasons uh, we're here talking about parachutes is uh, when it comes for Orion program, uh, CPAS is, is one of the, the top drivers for uh, loss of vehicle, in this case for 
EM1. Uh, Mike's going to talk a little bit in just a second about the number one, which is, <laughs> I didn't label that one, but that's MMOD off to the left there. Um, the, the second one is actually the, the parachute system itself, and then uh, the third one down there that I'm, I'm also pointing to is a four bay cover jettison and, and separation, and CPAS plays a role in that because of the four bay cover parachutes as well. Um, one of the things that makes uh, parachutes uh, difficult is uh, the, the, the difficulty in modeling the parachutes. Um, it's, it's almost exclusively empirical. We do develop some models that are physics-based, and then we use the test data that we gather to ground those models. Um, but then there's other aspects uh, of the system that we don't model at all. Uh, for example, in our models, we just assume that inflation takes place, that the parachutes actually inflate, uh, which is, we don't model that. We don't predict that it will happen. We just, that's one of the reasons why parachute systems uh, when they're developed, they go very heavily off of what's been used previously because they know that those parachutes inflate uh, unless there's a, a lot of uh, schedule and budget available to, to develop a new system. Um, and, and what we found in, in the deployment itself, uh, the parachutes coming out and, and deploying is shown in the picture here. Um, it can only really be validated by a repeated demonstrations of, of, those, uh, of that deployment. Uh, the picture shows uh, from one of our drop tests, you can see the main parachutes as they're coming out. And then the, in the center of the page, you've got the, the dots, uh, the little white dots. Those are the pilot parachutes with the main deployment bags attached to them. And then the upper right corner, you can see the, one of the drogue parachutes as it's flying away after it was cut away. Um, one way to think about this, one, our, our chief engineer uh, talks about this all the time, that it, the parachute system is, is one of the... Is, is maybe the only system that has to assemble itself in midair and uh, at, a, at a very wide range of possible velocities and orientations, especially when it comes to human spaceflight where we'd like to have the capability to do pad aborts. Um, if you think about uh, whereas a, a pad abort where you're relatively low velocity, where it takes longer for parachutes to inflate as compared to maybe a, a high altitude abort where you're moving faster or maybe entry conditions where uh, you're going to open a lot harder. Uh, it's, uh, it, it can be a, a really big challenge. Um, so to, to speak a little bit about that parachute testing, so just to put it in perspective, the Apollo program had uh, 151 parachute drop tests in their, in their program. Orion uh, will have uh, 44 by the time that we're done. Um, we just completed our first qual test uh, just at the end of September. Um, there's the, the chart on the right uh, we use quite a bit. This is from uh, SRB uh, parachutes from the sh space shuttle program uh, to, sh to show, we call it the reliability curve, that, that basically after you reach about 25 demands or 25 tests, in this case mission, that uh, you start to see that, that knee in the curve and you start to... Uh, that, that, um, you've reached a, a fairly good reliability at that point. Um, on, on this chart, I, I show just a collage of our, uh, some of our development drop tests before we got into our qual test program. I'm not, I'm not gonna go through each one of these, um, but you notice a couple of things on this. One, uh, we tested different fa failure scenarios where we had, for example, one main parachute out uh, that's important because if, if one main parachute's out, the parachutes behave differently. If you have a skip stage, they also behave very differently. Um, essentially, one of the main parachutes will take all of the air, and it takes longer for the other parachutes to, uh, to, to inflate. Um, but we learned a lot of very valuable lessons in the development program. And these, these charts, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through them, but basically... As we went through, we, we marked which, um, what lessons we learned and what design updates that we made to make our parachute system more reliable. Um, and as a result of that, we did see that through the development uh, process that um, it resulted in a 30% improvement in the loss of crew estimates based on the parachute system. And this is based off an ex expert elicit elicitation by the SNMA community. Um, 
We also found that at the end of the program that the number of improvements that we needed to make uh, seemed to uh, seem to seem to drop and so that we we felt pretty good at the end of the that development program that we had uh, we had done enough testing um, so I'm going to jump into I'm going to jump into some lessons learned this is not a comprehensive list of, of lessons learned but some things to think about uh, the, the first one uh, has to do with test techniques it doesn't even have to do with the flight parachute systems themselves um, Sometimes getting the test article out at the desired test point can be more challenging or just as challenging as uh, the flight parachute system itself. Uh, whether that's coming out of an airplane or, or using balloons, I know that, uh, that Boeing is uh, Boeing's struggling a little bit with, uh, with getting the balloons to, um, to get them on test point as well. Uh, this, this example that I show here, uh, what you can see in the, in the picture on the left is our, our test vehicle and a, a pallet that the test vehicle sits on coming out of the aircraft. We use parachutes to pull it out. And uh, there's a mechanism that releases once we get out of the aircraft to reposition, uh, to reposition the, the, the load path. And what you can see, the picture on the right there shows uh, there's a, a Kevlar strap at the time that we were using that, uh, that failed. Um, luckily, it, it held and uh, be, by friction um, came all the way down and we, we came to the, down to the ground safely but uh, because of that we've uh, essentially stopped testing our parachutes at 35,000 feet until we can understand uh, you know our system better and and have more robustness uh, to make sure that we don't cause uh, you know flight safety issues or um, cause a bad test um, so the next lesson learned uh, has to do with um, uh, analysis and, and subscale test techniques. Um, are the, the first one is that the, the computational techniques that exist and the analysis that, tech, that exists right now, um, we can't just rely on those. Um, although we're, we're getting closer, uh, there's still more development that's needed. Uh, one example of that is, um, so we, we We've done some analysis where we did some analysis that um, to understand the the snatch loading of the main parachutes as it's coming out. The, the pilots get kind of a head start and then they, they yank the, the main parachutes out of their bays. And we found that those loads were higher than expected in the analysis. And so uh, based on that and a little bit of test data that we could gather, we developed a, it's called an energy modulator system that basically uh, reduces the load uh, through the system or, or takes that that uh, the high uh, the high load pulse out that's the the picture in the upper right shows the energy modulator stowed on top of the the main deployment bag it's just basically two two pieces of kevlar that are sewn together with a lot of stitching and when that load arrives you tear the stitching and instead of the load going into the the pilot or the main bag handles uh, it goes into tearing out that stitching um, and what we found this this time it kind of uh, leaned in our favor uh, but what we found is that that analysis was was very very conservative and we didn't need as much energy modulators we thought we did that's the direction that you'd like to go in in the conservative way but um, we're not quite there yet on analysis the second one that I'll mention here has to do with subscale testing it's very tempting to want to do subscale testing because it's much much cheaper and much less logistically challenging um, and so as we we did some testing in support of pendulum I'm going to talk in just a second about pendulum uh, but we wanted to do a large number of tests for not as much money and so we scaled the parachutes and the load down and uh, we did a, a very extensive program both in the Ames 80 by 120 wind tunnel and then also in uh, some subscale airdrop tests and what we found, unfortunately, is we missed the scaling, and um, the the subscale results weren't um, uh, they weren't easily applied to the full scale system. And so, if if uh, if the parachute community would like to to get to the point where we can use subscale testing in the future, uh, those there's there's more study that's required. Uh, the last thing that I'll mention. Um, has to, and maybe this is the most important lesson learned is that uh, there needs to be adequate system level testing. Um, our chief engineer uh, always talks about that uh, in order for us to have a successful design, it needs to be given the opportunity to fail. Um, 
And in order to see that, not necessarily a full-scale failure where you hit the where you hit the the desert at a very high speed, but um, uh, even just small parts of the parachute system, uh, and and having the uh, sufficient instrumentation and video coverage is really key to helping us find those problems uh, before they become a very big problem. Uh, and we've really benefited from the instrumentation that we've had. Um, I say, uh, you know, that there needs to be an adequate number of tests. Uh, that number is very design dependent, um, and it also depends on how close the, your current system is to previous systems. So, for example, I showed the chart earlier that Apollo had 151 drop tests, and we have something like 44. Um, we don't need to go to 151 to get the same reliability because we, we have learned. But at the same time, we have significant enough differences that we do need to understand, you know, for example, how our system interacts with the vehicle, how we pack, how we, uh, how we deploy, all of those things are very important uh, to learn. Um, as, as one example, maybe Ben, if you could click the video here. Uh, as one example here, this, uh, this video shows something we call uh, the pendulum effect. You can see the, the parachute system going back and forth. Maybe you can do it one more time. Um, it gets into this pendulum mode when we have uh, two, only two main parachutes. And this is a problem because you might, impact, uh, you might impact at a poor angle and at different velocities than what you're designed for. Um, but it's important to point out here that we didn't realize we had this problem until we had run the, we had run t the two main tests only with a one failure. We'd done that three times and it wasn't until the third time that we realized what was going on. The first time it didn't even happen. The second time it happened but it was suppressed. We didn't realize that it was happening and it wasn't until the third time that it happened. And so uh, it just uh, underscores the importance of doing an adequate number of, of system tests. And I think that's it for me. Um, okay, so NMOD, NMOD, micrometeoroids, and orbital debris. Micrometeoroids are the natural stuff coming from asteroids and comets mostly, and orbital debris is the man-made stuff. It's the same threat, just different sources. Uh, the threat being impact from an object going several kilometers per second. So as, there we go, Brian's chart showed the, um, MMOD risk is the is the highest, and it has been across for all the human spaceflight programs for the past several years. And I just show the shuttle risk here uh, as an example. They were one in 200. Um, you could get one in 350 if you factored in inspection. Then you'd have to have a, a reaction after you you discovered something. Uh, the robotic community is also seeing more and more um, issues with having to deal with MMOD requirements there. They're uh, being levied with uh, requirements to to mitigate generation of more orbital debris. So they have to be able to prove that they can survive their mission and be able to deorbit after the end of their mission so that they don't generate more orbital debris. So these next few charts here are just some some examples from the um, from ISS and shuttle of some different uh, impacts that you, you may have seen before. This is one on the um, ISS solar array. It took out about three or four uh, solar cells. Um, this, is, uh, this is from one of the uh, shuttle radiator panels. Uh, this one here is kind of interesting. This is the service module on ISS, and each one of those red circles is an MMOD impact. Um, all of, none of those penetrated the pressure shell, but you get an idea of, of actually how many impacts are actually occurring. Uh, this is some window damage on one of the shuttles. Uh, this was damage on the uh, handle of this tool, and that damage actually caused damage to one of the astronauts EVA gloves when they grabbed it and it abraded the glove. Uh, and then this is one of the uh, S-band assemblies. So what I was going to do is have a few high-level lessons learned, kind of shows how 
we evolved learning, learning about the MMOD environment um, and uh, how we got to the mitigation that we're, we're doing today. Uh, and the first one is the importance of direct measurement. By direct measurement, I mean either getting your hands on a piece of space hardware that flew and was brought back and it has impact damage and being able to analyze that and, and incorporate that, that data. Or alternately having a, um, uh, sensors in orbit that are able to, uh, to uh, detect impacts and feed that information back down to the, um, back down to the ground. Uh, during Gemini, that's when they really first started looking at uh, direct measurement data. Um, that's when the uh, meteoroid source was really clarified. Prior to that time, it was kind of unknown where the meteoroids were. It was thought maybe that they were actually in orbit around the Earth. Um, and with the Gemini data, they, they found that no, actually the meteoroids for the most part are, are coming from beyond Earth's orbit. And also Gemini is when they first started getting evidence that orbital debris is, uh, is starting to be a problem. Um, and then through the years, the shuttle and Apollo um, were able to uh, get a better idea of the, how the orbital debris environment grew and what it was consisting of. Um, with direct measurement data, we do have a pretty good understanding of the orbital debris environment around the ISS and shuttle altitudes. That's because uh, the majority of the direct measurements that we've been able to do are either on the shuttle itself, on the radiator panels or, or windows, or on hardware that's been brought back down from orbit, obviously, on the shuttle. So there's a pretty relatively good understanding of what that environment is like in that, that region. Yet beyond that region, you go higher, then you have to extrapolate and use um, various assumptions. And there's, um, when you look at the different orbital debris models, there's pretty good agreement that around 700 to 800 kilometers is a peak in orbital debris. And what that peak is, it varies because there are all these uncertainties on um, you know, how to extrapolate to that to get that data. So that that really highlights why. Uh, more direct measurement, uh, getting assets up in that higher region um, is, is important. That's something that's, that's been a concern for a long time. Um, also, uh, our understanding of the, the composition and the nature of the, uh, the MMOD environment. There's actually two environment. There's two environment models. There's one for micrometeoroids. There's one for orbital debris. Uh, they're, they're very similar, but the they do describe the different environments. Um, as we've been going through the years, um, early failures would identify threat. Also, um, different points in time, we've been able to identify what the consist constituents of the orbital debris is. Uh, back in STS-7 was when uh, paint flecks were first identified as, uh, as being in the, in the debris cloud. Um, there was also uh, the Soviet would use uh, liquid um, potassium, uh, sodium potassium, uh, and that was identified using, uh, using radar data. And all that has been constantly fed into the orbital debris model over the years. Back in 1981, a delta upper stage exploded. The, uh, the delta was actually launched in 1978, so it was just a dead derelict in orbit. And that explosion produced about 200 pieces of trackable debris. Trackable is about 10 centimeters or so. So the, uh, the actual number of, of, of smaller pieces is uh, order of magnitude or more, more than that. And that was really the first inkling um, that this was a source of orbital debris, these, these dead objects up in, the, up in the orbit. And it did result in mitigation um, guidelines that were started back then and they continue today to, to either passivate those those um, objects if you can, uh, or just make sure they don't end up in orbit. And then modeling and, me and measurement over the years has showed that the, the growth in, in the debris um, is more than just explosions. Uh, it's debris on debris uh, impacts is really, is really uh, accelerating. That resulted in what's called the 25-year rule, which are, are guidelines that, that say that um, your satellite can't be in orbit for more than 25, 25 years. And a lot of the lessons learned are, um, 
are from the human human spaceflight programs because that's where the resources really got into understanding the MMOD um, and understanding how to protect against it. Um, but many of those those lessons and methodologies can be applied to the across the different programs and to the robotic guys because they are reaching out and asking for help also. One, one example is this JPSS-1. Um, uh, we're able to use uh, some shield designs for ISS to apply to uh, a uh, propellant tank that JPSS-1 was worried about. And ballistic limit equations, which are, uh, those are equations that um, describe the effectiveness of a shield for MMOD it, um, in terms of a critical diameter versus the, the velocity. And, those were developed for the most part for shuttle and for ISS, but uh, they can be manipulated mathematically to be used with other similar but different configurations, uh, different materials. Um, so the, the robotic community are, are, are taking, taking advantage of that and picking back, piggybacking some of that information. And then I had a, a list of just a, a few more I guess you can call them lessons or, or things that are, are still ongoing concerns. Um, the first one is uh, making sure you understand the difference between risk and assessed risk. Assessed risk is what you get with your risk assessment. And you can improve assessed risk uh, by um, uh, getting more information on the, on the environment models, um, maybe improving the fidelity of your, your space, spacecraft configuration. Uh, you're helping out the assessed risk. You're not changing the risk. Uh, you're only, only going to improve the risk by doing something like um, adding more shielding to your, your spacecraft or, or maybe modifying your, your attitude or your orbit. Um, I, I spoke about validating models with real world data as far as direct measurement. That goes also with testing. Uh, testing is, is very important. Hypervelocity impact testing is, is expensive. It's tough to do. We can only really get up to around 10 kilometers per second. But um, it is very important to be able to see what the actual physics are um, when, uh, when different objects are impacting different shields and different spacecraft components. Uh, the orbital debris and micro the MMOD issue is, uh, is a shared problem. Um, so we do need to share the information. The MMOD community is fairly, fairly close-knit, and there is a lot of uh, information exchange between um, NASA and ESA and, and the other universities, and it's important to keep that, keep that going. It's important to understand the limitations of the tools and to make sure that the customers do. There are huge uncertainties in several different elements of the risk assessment process. And it's and very important to um, make sure your customers know that th those uncertainties are going into the, the process. Make sure you understand them also. Uh, details matter in assessing MMOD risk. This is something we, we bump into quite often. Uh, and what I mean here is you can make very minor changes in your risk assessment, and these will end up being relatively major changes in your actual risk. Uh, so that means you need to make sure you nail down your, your space gap configuration, have it as accurate as possible, know what your... Uh, your, your tank thicknesses are, how much, how many layers of MLI you have, uh, if you're, how much, you know, area your blanket is covering. Because small changes in this will make um, significant changes in your risk and may drive, uh, it will drive decisions in, in design. Uh, and then understanding the transition from design-based to operational-based mitigation. Design-based, you usually have more options. Uh, you can, you can change hardware, you can change uh, change shielding when you get to the operational. You usually don't have as many options. Uh, not always true with ISS. They were, they have made augmentations to the shielding on, on ISS, but usually you're you're left with um, with your attitude and, and adjusting your orbit and that, those kind of mitigations. And then finally, uh, shape shape is a big issue as far as MMOD. Um, for a couple different reasons. One is the shape of your particle going in will, will determine what kind of damage you have. Think of the difference between a, a long fiber type thing um, versus maybe a pancake shape thing. You're going to have different damage. Also, the, the models are characterized by um, 
uh, characteristic length there. They're based on a length. And the orbital debris model assumes that everything is a sphere. Well, we know everything is not a sphere, but a sphere will give you about the most mass for a given length. Uh, because there are different shapes, uh, there may be some uh, overpredicting as far as the, the, the mass impact from, from orbital debris. So that's another thing that, that uh, we're concerned with today and, and trying to see if we can um, make changes to make it a little, little better. Orion's a deep space vehicle, so I'm surprised that MOD is going to be a major risk for Orion compared to everything else. Can you comment on that? That's actually EM1. EM1? Yeah, EM, EM1 is the ICPS, right? For the upper stage. EM1, the risk, as far as I understand it, for EM1, it's being driven by the launch vehicle. Um, and the, during launch, you're going to go through a that high region, remember I mentioned about 800 kilometers is the peak, peak region for orbital debris. It's going through that orbital debris region. And the upper stage, the ICPS, which is part of the, the launch vehicle, has exposed um, COPVs. Right. Yeah. It's her, her fault. <laughs> COPV, they're not, they're not covered by blankets, not covered by anything. They're hanging out. And, as far as I understand it, those are driving the risk for the EM-1 mission is actually the launch vehicle. All right, so on EM-2, will we have the EOS, has that exposure of the intense been corrected? Are there actually bigger things? Well, the I, think, I think the same type of issue for EM-2, yeah. It's it's a major it's a major risk, but remember, there are still major uncertainties associated with it. And a lot of times, when you have high uncertainties, you err on the conservative side. So that may be part of what we're seeing. Um, we're actually Lori and I are working on a uh, activity now to do some testing on COPVs to get a better idea of what the the failure criteria for the COPVs are. Um, if we find that they're actually more robust than what is being assumed right now for the risk assessments, that may have an effect on the assessed risk and bring it, bring it down a little bit. But that's just an example of the, the types of challenges that we have to deal with. Mike, you're popular. This question is for you, too. Um, you mentioned a 10-centimeter minimum trackable size. And I was curious, for the ISS shield, what's the size of debris or uh, micrometeorites that it's designed to withstand? I don't know for sure. I want to say it's around two or three millimeters, I think. So there's a gap between what's trackable and what's yeah. what's withstandable. Yes. Is there any initiatives going on to try to track smaller stuff? There, there is, but that's always going to be an issue because you can have, depending on what it hits, you can have damage down to one millimeter, which will probably never be tracked. That's what the models, the models are for. The orbital debris models will use what they know from the impact data on the small end and what they have been able to um, see uh, on the high end, and there's this gap in between that they have to be modeled, and damage can occur in that gap. How about the range of velocities? Do the models seem to understand those pretty well? Yeah, yeah. As far as velocities go, uh, I think that's mostly physics and orbital mechanics. Um, I think the high end for orbital debris is around 14 to 15 kilometers per second. Um, micrometeoroids, they can get much higher. They can get up to 60, 70 kilometers per second. But they're, uh, they're not as, there's not as much of it. Thanks. 
So, is it on? Okay. This is a question for Lori. Uh, somebody had forwarded to me about a week ago an article from Space Daily, and the headline is, Study Explains Strength Gap Between Graphene and Carbon Fiber, and then it goes on to say that, and I'll just quote from the article, uh, carbon fiber, pillar strength of materials manufactured for decades isn't as good as it could be. Uh, they found the polymer chains that make up a common carbon fiber are prone to misalign during manufacture. And, and my question is whether that is a known defect mode uh, for CFPVs that is uh, being looked at and, and mitigated. Uh, is that, and it, when I listened to you, it, it appeared to be a vehicle for stress, stress rupture, perhaps? Yeah, so I read that article, too. <laughs> um, I don't know because that's a, that's a totally new, I guess, you know, that is not information that I had before in terms of um, sort of an underlying mechanics behind stress rupture. That isn't the approach that we're taking. The approach that we're taking is, is purely empirical. We're, we're doing a test to go capture stress rupture failures on a much, much larger scale than what they're working in that particular um, article. So I don't know if it's related. It could be, um, but I would think there would need to be a lot more mechanistic work to try to iron that out and determine um, if it's related. Thanks. Hey, this is one for, uh, for Brian. Um, you didn't mention it out loud, but talking about coordinating the risk of damaging the vehicle under loads versus damaging a crew member. And, and the pendulum became an issue because it violated some human limits. And so can you talk a little bit about a lesson learned with regard to keeping those at the forefront of your mind when you're doing a hardware test, per se? It, like, it's, it's implied, it's embedded, but sometimes it's the human limits that drive you to make a design change. And then I have a follow-up for MMOD. Sure. Um, so, for our system, we actually have we actually have requirements that do that that keep us on task, so to speak, to make sure that when we do run testing, and the you know follow-on analysis that we do, that we are meeting those human limits. Um, and you're you're right. We did find that there were that there were some potential issues when it came to pendulum. Um, but it's really the requirements that keep us pointed in the in the right direction. Yeah, I have one. Just, oh, just a quick follow-up. Sorry. Um, I was going to say for MMOD, uh, it was actually very interesting how the numbers for MMOD changed when a model changed for ESD, and we do look at at, at that as a contributor when we do our PRA assessments for meeting our lock LOM equivalent requirements and for ICPS we actually you talk about transition of design base to operational mitigation and in this case we actually decided to change how many revs we have before we go to TLI and while that reduced the risk by half or, or however literally um, it did impact and we couldn't really quantify it that time in orbit to check out systems, things like that. And so that became a concern when we knew that US was coming for EM2, and that's our first crew, crewed flight. And you know, would we have the same issue or not? And so um, the numbers for MMOD were better, and now we're actually looking at increasing our time because we're in a different type of orbit that gets us away from some of the concern and leveraging that against being able to check out systems. And so, um, Again, you, you talk about the importance of model and model validation, but those those numbers, even if they are conservative, we're taking them seriously and we're we're adjusting accordingly to try and reduce the risk of, of locker long. They they may be conservative, they may not. There's big big uncertainties in in the orbital debris population once you get beyond about 400 600 kilometers and. Everyone who uses the, the NASA orbital debris model, which is called ORDM, uh, has felt the effect you're talking about of, of risk assessments um, showing higher risk. And there's, there's a few different reasons for that. The, the new model, it incorporates some of the events 
that have happened recently, like the Chinese anti-satellite test and the Iridium Cosmos collision. Um, that wasn't in the previous model. And also, Ordem 3 has a population of, um, of particles that are a higher density, of like stainless steel density. The old model just assumed everything was aluminum. And obviously, everything is not aluminum. So uh, Ordem 3, uh, on recommendation from the NESC on a previous assessment, added in um, a population of the higher higher density, which does more damage when it hits, so that's also affecting the, the risk numbers. Okay, um, mine's for Lori on. Um, so, is there an ideal size, um, shape, um, and thickness of a COPV uh, based on the, the temperature or? Uh, fluid that would be put inside? Uh, some correlation? I mean, you know, some guidelines. Um, not necessarily, although those are some of the design constraints that you can have in a particular COPV design. Um, it, a lot of a lot of the, I guess, the robustness to things like temperature and fluids and stuff um, is kind of borne out in the design period where they're actually working with the finite element model to dial in, okay, well, what is the actual response of the overall structure, which is both the liner and the overwrap, to whatever environments you have. So if you have temperature extremes, that's got to be dialed in. And the design, and then once the you know, once you work it with the model, you can look at whatever vulnerabilities that particular design has and you can add robustness at that point. A lot of that's done early on. In, I guess, um, in a typical design approach, they'll go through and do all of that using modeling and then, run, and then maybe a few tests. Um, but you could do it with testing as well. The compatibility question um, is usually done with coupon tests and then that is added in. But there's not any particular guidelines for those particular issues. A lot of the size and shapes of COPVs are driven by um, packaging constraints within the spacecraft and, and what there's room for and, and, and also considerations on cost and schedule that you can get with COPV manufacturer, manu current manufacturers so you might want to buy an off-the-shelf design because it works with your particular propulsion system for example and um, that'll save you both schedule and um, cost to do that um, so not really I mean it's you're gonna look at those designs for or those constraints for a particular design usually any other questions Jim do you have one we got time for one more All right, so when I, this is back to MMOD. Um, so when I was working on Space Station back in the 80s, where the program was literally tied in knots over the MMOD issue. Um, we didn't have much data to go on back then. Um, and so we agonized about it for several years without really coming to conclusion on, on the design strategy, the operational strategy. Um, and, and a big difference was made in 89 uh, when the uh, shuttle got back to service and we brought LDEF back and we finally had some some uh, real data to build better models on. Um, and it, but it finally got to the point where, you know, model or no model, the program had to make some decisions and move on. Um, and, and so what we were dealing with was that, that gap between detectability at 10 centimeter level and shieldability only up to about four centimeters back then. And we didn't know we were fooling ourselves that we could shield up to four centimeters, but, but that was the estimate back then. Um, and, and so we knew that there was a gap between what we could shield against and what we could detect. So there's a, a range there where you're going to get hit and you can't see it coming. Um, so, so even today, our, our basic strategy is, you know, shield to the limit of, of our shield ability, detect as much as we can and dodge when we can detect something coming that we can't shield. And in the middle, we just have an accepted risk. Um, 
the, the question is, when we had no idea that the MMOD population was going to grow by orders of magnitude today and continue growing into the future, so the risk is only getting worse. Um, I was at a conference recently where I asked an Air Force Two star uh, about, uh, I was at a space resiliency summit and he was talking about how we're going to make our future systems more resilient. So I asked him, are we making them more resilient against MMOD? And he said, wow, that's a great question. We should study that. So after I got past the, the two star two step, um, then, then all the contractors who were at the meeting came up and said, oh man, I'm glad you at NASA asked the question of the Air Force, you know, because we want to know too. So there's a big industry out there that, that wants to know the answer to that. So the question is, with all that preliminary, is from an agency strategic standpoint, really an, a multi-agency strategic standpoint, when are we going to reach that tipping point where we recognize MMOD isn't something we just shield against, but something that we're going to have to actively mitigate and, and deal with that growing problem of junk out there in space. So that might be a question as much for Ralph and Greg as much as for Mike. The, I, <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's been recognized. The past several years, we've seen um, guidelines for, for mitigation being the 25-year rule that I that I mentioned to try to prevent the additional generation of orbital debris. Uh, I know there are some designs out there for uh, either piggybacking on existing satellites that will go up to that higher 800 region, or or standalone satellites to be able to um, to measure the debris to get a better idea of what ex what exactly we're dealing with. So there there is a lot of a lot of work. There's a lot of other concerns. Um, CubeSats is a big concern because there are companies are going to be putting hundreds or thousands of CubeSats up there, which uh, a lot of people just see them as more, they're just orbital debris generators. So there's, there's a lot of conversation 